When we talk about someone who has autoimmune disease, the first thing that I would do is to increase fiber in the diet because when fiber is consumed, specifically soluble fiber, when soluble fiber is consumed, it passes through the digestive tract, through the small intestine, and it comes to the colon. And at that point, it has not been touched. And it gets to the colon, and the bacteria in the gut transform the fiber. There's a metabolic process. And so this fiber is food for our gut. We need energy, so we eat food. The bacteria in our gut need energy, and this is the food that the good guys eat. And this is the reason why I say that the bacteria in our gut are vegan. If you go down the line and look, what are the bacteria that make a difference in terms of our health? A positive difference. They're the foods that process plant fiber. The Vidal Speaks Podcast. Episode 88, Dr. Will Balsowitz, The Lack of Fiber Epidemic, Using Fiber and Fermented Foods to Improve Health and Gut Microbiome. Welcome to Vidal Speaks. My name is Deborah Vidal, former 11-year LPGA golf pro turned classical homeopath, certified plant-based nutritionist, and wellness coach. Each week here on Vidal Speaks, we bring you knowledge, inspiration, or natural remedies to help you take charge of your health and feel your best. I believe health is freedom and knowledge is power, so tuning in each week will give you the power to take steps towards freeing yourself from the chains that hold you back from having the energy to do all you want in life. No matter where you are in your journey of wellness, Vidal Speaks can help. I promise. Welcome back to the Vidal Speaks podcast, my friends. You know that it is here on this podcast where you learn so much, so much about the lies that we're fed from the very agencies that say they have our backs and they'll protect us from harm. Yeah, right. You guys know that they don't. It's up to each one of us to learn how to find health and how to get well if we're not well currently. There's so much information out there. I know it can be confusing, but in the end, when you hear something over and over again by the many plant-based doctors out there who are not only speaking from science that has proven what they practice, but also because they have reversed chronic diseases over and over again in their practice with a whole foods, plant-based vegan diet, it's no longer a wonder what diet is the best. It's now a fact, and we have to stop listening to the people that are just trying to back up the idea that eating dead animals is healthy. Really now, you guys? Where's the science behind that idea? Show me any cancer clinic using meat and flesh and eggs and dairy to cure cancer. You won't find one, because once people get cancer, these clinics put them on the high, raw, all-organic vegan diet consisting of whole fruits and veggies, high in greens with some nuts, seeds, and grains. That's because this is the proven diet that heals. So don't be fooled or duped into thinking you can stay healthy eating meat. And I have to say once again, that with all we know today about the rates of heart disease, cancer, and autoimmune diseases, and with all we know about climate change, with the biggest contributor to climate change being animal agriculture, then we should feel absolutely bad eating animals and contributing to this serious problem that we're facing in our environment. So let's all live responsibly and eat a plant-based diet and save ourselves and our planet, please. And today you're going to hear from a great doctor that's trying to spread this very word. His name is Dr. Will Balsowitz. As you know from last week, we call him Dr. B. He's back this week to speak about how fiber and fermented foods can reboot our health and our microbiome and why that's so important. I have the utmost respect for Dr. B because he was traditionally trained and like many of the other plant-based docs, once they get into clinical practice and see how many people are sick and then they take the time to ask them what they're eating, well, he knew right away that diet and nutrition had to play a part in health of the gut, although he was not taught that or told any of that in medical school. So like a good doctor who wants to heal his patients, he looked further and he went on to study nutrition. He ended up learning that it's through a whole foods, plant-based diet that he can do the best work with his patients. 
That's so awesome that this early in his career he figured this out because now he can heal so many people before they get cancer or these horrible diseases. And like Hippocrates said, who is the father of medicine, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And he also said that the role of a doctor is to first do no harm to prevent overtreat, and that's exactly what Dr. B's role is with his patients. One day, the way he practices medicine will be the norm or the new allopathic model, but right now, it is not the current allopathic model, so it is up to you guys out there to learn how to be healthy and not just do what you're told by your doctor. You need to be involved in your health and understand all the things that your doctor tells you, and you need to be able to ask him questions so you can learn what feels right for you and you can feel good about your choices because you know what I say, ultimately we have to live and die by our choices so we should take them very seriously. Okay, now I'm not gonna spend much time introducing Dr. B because you can go to his site and read his bio or you can listen to last week's episode where I talk all about him. So I'm just gonna say a few words and then we'll go talk to him about fiber and fermented foods for our gut health, okay? Dr. Will Balsowitz is one of the leading gut health experts in the country and the creator of the popular Happy Gut MD Instagram account. He is a board-certified gastroenterologist with an integrative approach and a passion for gut health. He advocates for consuming more plants, prebiotics over probiotics, and do-it-yourself fermentation. Dr. B has a BS from Vanderbilt University, an MD from Georgetown University, and a Master's of Clinical Investigation from Northwestern University. He received the Ram Book Award as the top internal medicine resident at Northwestern and was chief medical resident. He also received the award as top GI fellow at the University of North Carolina and was chief gastroenterology fellow. While at UNC, he did advanced epidemiology training at the top rated UNC Gilling School of Public Health and received a prestigious grant from the National Institute of Health. Dr. B has an accomplished background in research with more than 20 scientific articles published and more than 40 presentations at national meetings, including being selected for the Digestive Disease Week Presidential Plenary as one of the top studies among thousands of submissions. These days, he is a partner at Low Country Gastroenterology in Charleston, South Carolina, and the founder of Dr. B Gut Health. He regularly gives sold-out talks in the Charleston community and in 2016 started Happy Gut MD on Instagram as a way to connect with his patients and share his perspective. It has rapidly become the most popular gastroenterology account on Instagram and the premier source for gut health tips from a trusted source. In his spare time, he enjoys hanging with his family, swimming, and experimenting with fermentation recipes. All right, you guys, you ready? Let's go talk to Dr. B. Hi, Dr. B. Welcome back to the Vidal Speaks podcast. Thanks so much for joining me again today because I look so forward to talking about fermented foods and how they're good for our gut and our microbiome. And I also want to know why our microbiome is vegan, like you said in your preview. So let's get started. All right. Well, this is a great topic. And so let's just take a step back um, and start with the basics when it comes to the gut microbiome. So if you go back 10 years ago, we only knew that there were 200 species of bacteria in and on the body, which is amazing because as of today, we know of at least 10,000 species. Wow. Wow. And there are estimates that it could be as many as 35,000 species. So what changed? Well, in the past, we really only had the ability to use culture techniques to identify bacteria. And the problem is that 99% of the bacteria in our gut is a type called anaerobic. Anaerobic basically means that it cannot be exposed to oxygen. If you expose it to oxygen, then it's going to die. 
Mm-hmm. And so the problem is that anaerobic bacteria are incredibly difficult to culture. And therefore, we never had the ability to really identify that they even exist. Mm. Fast forward to 2017, we now know that there are at least 10,000 species of bacteria in and on the body. Let's focus on the gut. In the gut, there are 100 trillion microbes, 100 trillion microbes. So that's like taking all of the stars in the Milky Way. You see every single one of them. And multiplying that by a thousand. Jeez. It's, it's staggering. And these microbes, they're made up of bacteria. They're made up of archaea, which is basically a single celled organism that's been around for 4 billion years. And frankly, we don't know that much about them. Hmm. It's also made up of protozoa and fungi, meaning yeast. Mm-hmm. And then the last thing, are viruses. When I say 100 trillion, I haven't even touched on the viruses. That's a separate number. There's a quadrillion viruses. Wow. Quadrillion. Oh my and gosh. So, which is terrifying if you think about it yeah. because we hear about getting a virus, you know. I hear about getting a virus and I'm like, oh my gosh, a virus. That's, that's really scary. But it yet is. my body right now is made up of a quadrillion viruses. So are we really human? <laughs> Well, you could make a strong scientific argument that we are wildly outnumbered and be 100% accurate because literally there are 10 microbes for every single cell in the body. So if you were to look at the number of cells in your body, you are only 10% human. Wow. And that is the generous number because actually if you get into the genetics of it, 99% of your genes come from these microbes. Amazing. And so that means from a genetic perspective, you are only 1% human. Wow, that's something you really got to listen to a few times. <laughs> <laughs> it's incredible. Oh, it so, is. I mean, I actually, I give a lot of talks here in the Charleston area, and this is one of the topics that we cover. And I love getting into this because you just kind of see people's eyes bug out like, oh right. my gosh. <laughs> like you got my attention now. <laughs> yeah. I tell them, I say, I, I, what I always do is I say, you know, give me a thumbs up. And so I get the whole crowd to give me a thumbs up. And then I say, okay, look at your thumb because right now there are more bacteria on your thumb than there are people in Great Britain. Oh. Like literally right there. So... Yeah, um, so it's cool. really interesting stuff. And here's what's cool. So what is the highest concentration of bacteria in the entire planet? The answer is it's inside of you. It's your colon. Mm. Your colon has more bacteria per uh, basically, you know, volume than anything else on the entire planet. And they're there for a reason. We have been inappropriately taught that these bacteria are dangerous. And there's a, there's a reason for that. If you go back through history, let's go back to the time of Louis Pasteur, which is the same time he was in France, but this is the same time that the American Civil War was happening. And prior to Louis Pasteur, people believed that disease was caused by something called miasma. And if you get a chance, Google miasma because it, it's a it's a really interesting picture that pops up because it looks like something out of a horror movie. Whoa. And basically you'll see like a, a cloaked skeleton floating through the air. And so this during this period of time, prior to the 1860s, people thought that this concept of dark air was the cause of disease. So not bacteria. What I'm talking about is, let me try to like put it into perspective of like a visual. People thought that it was this concept like you're walking past a swamp in the middle of the night and it's really dark and there's a mist on the ground and it smells funny. And so that's what miasma was. It was a dark, foul air and they thought that that is what caused the plague in Europe. Mm. Wiping out millions of people. And then Louis Pasteur comes along and he says, "Uh, uh, uh-uh-uh, not so fast. And he he basically studies fermentation, which is one of the great ironies, is he studies fermentation 
and basically figures out that it's bacteria that not only ferment our food, but also that cause the spoilage of milk. And by doing that, they were able to figure out that it's bacteria that cause disease. Now, this was really important at this time because you have to understand that in the 19th century and even the early 20th century, this is what was killing people. Mm -hmm. And so no matter what period of time you look at, we as humans are always going to focus on what's in, in front of us right now. And so what are we focusing on right now in our healthcare um, community? Well, we're focused on cancer. We're focused on heart disease. But now there's these, this new breed of diseases that has emerged in the last 30 years. Autism barely existed in the 1980s. Yep. And it's exploded. Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, autoimmune disease, celiac, lupus, type 1 diabetes, rheumatoid arthritis, eczema. So we have these new diseases that are emerging now. And so this is what we're focused on right now. But if you were to go back to the early 1900s, they were focused on pneumonia or tuberculosis because that's what was killing people. And so it became this naturally it became this idea that bacteria are bad we have to kill them and so we innovated for all aspects of our life to destroy the bacteria so there was the invention of of antibiotics which antibiotics immediately added 15 years to our life expectancy that was around world war ii yeah, I can imagine how happy they were when they discovered those at that time with all the people dying of all these dreaded bacterial diseases. Absolutely. So that was a huge deal. But then even beyond that, we figured out how to sterilize our food and it started with canning, but it moved on to other things. And now it includes 5,000, 6,000 preservatives. I mean, if you actually get into the number of chemicals that have been developed in the last 100 years, Whoa. that's in our food. By the way, most of which has had zero human testing. Yeah. And the few that have had human testing, it's like, hey, let's try this out for a week and see what happens. Okay, we're good. <laughs> Let alone, let's have people eat this for 30 years. Right. So, you know, five to 6,000 preservatives in our food, GMOs, you know, we, we, even beyond our food, I mean, of course, our cleaning products in our home, yeah. chlorine in our water. I'm not saying chlorine in our water was a mistake. I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that we need to recalibrate and we need to take the chlorine out of our water because if it kills the bacteria on the way to our faucet, What's it going to do when we swallow it down into our gut? Exactly. And so, so basically, we went on this mission. We need to destroy these bacteria. We need to kill them. And we're finally in a place where I'm out there banging the drum and shouting through a megaphone, bacteria are our friends. We don't need to kill them. We need to embrace them. Mm -hmm. And we need to make the most of them because that is how we're going to make ourselves more healthy. And so, so when we talk about a plant-based diet as it relates to our gut, bringing it back full circle, what we're talking about is how can we make the most of these bacteria in our gut to get good health outcomes? And the number one predictor of the makeup of our microbiome is going to be the food that you eat. And that has been shown time after time after time in our studies. The food that you eat matters. It could enrich your life and make you more healthy, or it could have consequences and cause you harm and to develop disease. And the pathway that that happens is through these bacteria and the effects that they have. So I still have that number in my head that you said in the first episode that we eat three meals a day. It's, what do you say, something like 70,000 meals or something like that? And if we're counting on 
this to keep our microbiome healthy, then we better be putting the right kind of food in and not food that's going to harm our microbiome. So what kind of foods are the best for our microbiome? Yeah, so there is a, a brilliant researcher who in gastroenterology, he is like basically a rock star. And he's up in your neck of the woods. He's at the University of California, San Diego. His name is Rob Knight. This guy is brilliant. He's mm. doing something called the American Gut Project. And so the American Gut Project, basically for less than 100 bucks, they will send you a kit and you can send them a stool specimen. And the other aspect of it is they're going to have you fill out a questionnaire that's going to give them some basic information about you, what your lifestyle is like, how you eat, how you live, how much you sleep, all that kind of stuff. And you send a stool specimen and they're basically developing this huge national registry of microbiome specimens. Wow, that's cool. And it gives Rob the power to be able to do really interesting analyses. So I was in in May, I was in Chicago at Digestive Disease Week. It's the biggest meeting of the year. 20, 25,000 GI doctors from around the world. And Rob Knight presented data that I don't think he's published yet. But I got so excited when I saw this. So basically, he used an analysis, and this is objective stuff. Like he's not getting to cherry pick what he wants here. He's just punching it into the into the formula uh -huh. and basically seeing what comes out the other side. And so he did an analysis to identify what is the number one predictor of a healthy gut. And the answer was the diversity of the plants that you eat. Very cool. And so it wasn't necessarily that you're a vegan, mm -hmm. but what it was, was plant consumption, diversity of plants. And so I look at it like this. I could make arguments about what I believe to be the healthiest food that exists. I don't know that there's really one dominant food, but I, I would throw kale into the mix or broccoli sprouts but the issue is if you just ate kale or you just ate broccoli sprouts all day long, right. it would not be healthy. Yeah. That's so interesting because I just interviewed, I don't know if you heard it, Dr. Duyard. He was the guy that talked about eat wheat. And it was what he said too because he was saying, you know, a lot of people are gluten-free and many need to be. I mean, of course, if you have celiacs, it's a must. But there's so many non-celiac disease people who have gluten symptoms and he was just going off about how many people have you know these gastro gut issues and that they really can't tolerate gluten but they're missing out because he talked also about the diversity like if you're giving up all these whole grains and you're not eating any whole grains and you're not eating any beans and now you're not eating any wheat he mentioned that too about how it's this variety and some plants have a little bit more like kind of poisonous history, but our body needed that and other plants were easier to digest and some were harder. And it's this whole balance of this variety that keeps the gut healthy and people who are taking it out and eating only gluten-free foods, which are a lot of processed foods and a lot of white flours and things like that because they have a lot of the gluten-free foods are not always whole grain flours. And it's caused a lot of issues in his opinion. So it's kind of similar what he was saying. So you could be eating four foods that are so healthy, but if that's all you're eating, then your microbiome is going to be not healthy because you need yeah, the I'm variety. With you 100%. Right? I'm with you 100%. Um, I'm sure that you've seen in your practice food sensitivity explosion. Oh, I used to do a food sensitivity and ALCAT test. It's uh -huh. crazy. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah, it's crazy. It's amazing how many I mean, people are sensitive. I, I mean, gut issues, I could almost tell you, I don't think I had a person that came in that didn't have a gut issue. And sometimes they don't think they do, but then you hear their symptoms because as you said before, the gut is so related to other things like rheumatoid arthritis. Hey, there was a point 
in time where they were curing some people's rheumatoid arthritis with antibiotics, which showed it was very much bacterial for some people. So, I mean, it's such an important thing to have healthy, I guess, the saying, you know, you're only as healthy as your gut has a lot more meaning than we ever really thought when we heard that the first time ever. I agree 100%. So all health starts in the gut. I, that's one of the things that I have written on my Instagram account right in the front, and that's something that I believe. When we talk about rheumatoid arthritis, what we're talking about is the fact that 70% of the immune system lives in the gut. And that's where the immune system goes to train to know what is good and what is bad. And you cannot separate you cannot separate the immune system from the bacteria in the gut. Wow. The immune system cannot the immune system cannot thrive and do its job with an unhealthy gut. And so the problem that you run into is that if you if you break down the gut and make it weak, you know, I'll make an analogy. Imagine that you have a factory and you have a thousand workers. When people have alterations in their gut. And the term that we use, the medical term is dysbiosis, right. meaning that you're losing species of bacteria. You are losing diversity of bacteria. When you develop dysbiosis, that's kind of like firing 400 people from your factory. So now you got 600 workers. Can they make the factory go? Yeah, they can make the factory go, but you know that there's going to be mistakes. Mm-hmm. And so that's the fallout that happens. That's one of the examples of the fallout that can occur when you lose a healthy gut microbiome is that the immune system becomes confused. And that can mean an overactive immune system, which is autoimmune disease. Mm -hmm. And let me give you an example. Eosinophilic esophagitis. This is an autoimmune condition that occurs in the esophagus. The immune system goes on the attack. 25 years ago, this condition didn't even exist. Wow. Like it literally didn't even exist. We were doing upper endoscopies. It's not like we weren't detecting it. It literally did not exist 25 years ago. Amazing. New disease. And there are days where I see two patients on the same day. Mm. So... When you have an overactive immune system, you develop autoimmune disease. On the flip side, if your immune system is not active enough, you put yourself at risk for cancer. Our body is constantly turning over. We are constantly producing new cells. That's not a perfect process. Sometimes there are cells that are not healthy. And that's where the immune system needs to be there to basically clean up and take care of it. And if the immune system is, on, is asleep on the job, then you allow one of those types of cells to start to proliferate, to multiply, and that's when cancer can develop. And so that's just one example of where the gut is really critical. So what do people do if they realize that their immune system, maybe they get chronic infections, you know, it could be pneumonias or lung issues or sinus issues or... Um, it could be skin stuff or they have an autoimmune disease. So where, where do they begin when they want to improve that immune system by improving their gut? What's the first step? Well, uh, I think that, you know, what I'll say is this, first of all, there's the goal. And when I say the goal, I don't mean that people should drop what they're doing and just assume, like start doing this immediately. Because to be totally honest with you, many times that doesn't work. Mm -hmm. I think that you know when you have a goal in mind, you have to accept that it's going to be a process to get you towards that goal. And so what is the goal? Well, to me, the goal is a plant-based diet. Mm -hmm. To me, it's maximum fresh fruits and vegetables. And there's a science to it. And so... You know, this is one of the things that I love about this explosion of research into the microbiome is that there have been these debates. There have been these debates about nutrition. I mean, how many times are we going to reboot the Atkins diet? Exactly. Are we on like number really? five or Come six? Come on. Now? There's these debates from a nutritional perspective, though. I mean, there are people who will sit there and say, I believe that, you know, I believe that my ketogenic diet is the right way to go. And here's the reason why. And there's this doctor who says that, you know, you should be doing this. Here's the deal. 
I think that the answer is is there and it's time for the debate to stop because the microbiome has the answer. We can go to the gut and we can see what is the gut telling us. If the gut is affected by the food that we eat and the gut is the determinant of whether or not we develop disease or not or are healthy, well then what effect is our food having on our gut? And so when we talk about someone who has autoimmune disease, the first thing that I would do is to increase fiber in the diet. And the reason why is because when fiber is consumed, specifically soluble fiber, Mm -hmm. when soluble fiber is consumed, it passes through the digestive tract, through the small intestine, and it comes to the colon. And at that point, it has not been touched. And it gets to the colon, and the bacteria in the gut transform the fiber. There's a metabolic process. And so this fiber is food for our gut. Mm -hmm. We need energy, so we eat food. The bacteria in our gut need energy, and this is the food that the good guys eat. And this is the reason why I say that the bacteria in our gut are vegan, is that if you, go in down, if you go down the line and look, what are the bacteria that make a difference in terms of our health, a positive difference? They're the foods that process plant fiber. So are so those considered prebiotics? So a prebiotic is any fiber that basically has a health-promoting uh, effect in the body. I see. And so, you know, you talk about prebiotic versus probiotic. The simple concept behind the prebiotic, the bottom line, is that the prebiotic helps the healthy bacteria to grow and do their job. Mm -hmm. And so soluble fiber, which is a prebiotic, gets transformed by these gut bacteria into a short-chain fatty acid. And now, I have a couple questions right where you're there. The soluble fiber, that's mostly what's found in fruit and vegetables, right? I know some veggies have, like celery, that would be a little bit more insoluble, is it? Or is it still so, considered soluble? So when we separate out fiber, there's basically two broad categories, soluble fiber and insoluble fiber. Soluble fiber, let me give you an example. There's a fiber that I like called Benefiber. Uh, it's available at CVS, Walgreens, your local supermarket. It's a powder. Benefiber is literally one ingredient. It's just plant fiber. It comes from wheat dextrin, which you would think if you're gluten sensitive or if you have celiac disease that it's harmful, but actually it's gluten free. Mm. So wheat dextrin is this white powder. And if you pour water over it and stir it up within a minute, you won't even be able to tell that it's there. It'll just look like water. So when I say soluble fiber, I'm talking about something that dissolves completely in the liquid. On the flip side is insoluble fiber. Now, insoluble fiber is the stuff, for example, you take Metamucil. Metamucil, if you've ever had it before, is very granular. You stir it up and there's still sandy stuff down at the Mm -hmm. bottom. And that sandy stuff is the insoluble fiber. So when we talk about plant fiber, for example, if you take the skin of a plant, that is insoluble fiber. That insoluble fiber passes through the digestive tract. And um, basically what it does is it helps to promote good bowel movements. So it's great for constipation. Mm -hmm. It pulls water into the colon. It helps to keep things moving through. Most... Most insoluble fiber does not have a prebiotic effect, but there are some that do, and we call those resistant starches. Resistant starches are insoluble fiber that make make it all the way down to the colon without getting processed. And then when they get to the colon, the bacteria actually can work on them and, again, metabolize them into a short-chain fatty acid. And what foods have those? Um, a number of, uh, you find it in a lot of foods, even believe it or not, and I'm certainly not advocating for processed foods, but believe it or not, even processed foods. So for example, if you eat, you know, wheat bran, um, 
that has resistant starch. Classic things, potatoes, sweet potatoes, mm -hmm. um, you know, classic potatoes, like white potatoes. It's also found in seeds and nuts, whole grains, rice. Are beans uh, in that category? There, there is some resistant starch in beans too. Yeah, there is some resistant starch in beans. Beans are great because beans contain um, many different types of fiber, including these resistant starches and also soluble fiber. And when you eat beans, if you're not used to eating beans, they can be gas producing. But just something to think about, that gas production, I mean, maybe it was a little too much fiber than what your body was ready to handle in that moment. But that gas production is indicative of your body's your body fermenting the food. Mm. And when it ferments the food, it's producing these short chain fatty acids. So and that's I can a go good on thing. And on about these. It's a good thing. These short chain fatty acids, here's just one example of the benefits. There's so many of them. So if you ate beans and you didn't get gassy, I mean, you're kind of saying that the people who get gas after eating beans, it's kind of a good thing because your body's probably not used to that much fiber and it's just making these short chain fatty acids. But if someone eats beans and doesn't get it, that doesn't mean they're not having the same good benefit, right? Basically, what that would mean to me is that someone who does not get gassy, but they've consumed a moderate portion size of beans, it just means that their body is used to processing this. Mm -hmm. And, you know, our gut, our, our microbiome is adaptable. And that's one of the things that we have the opportunity to take advantage of, which is to ramp up our fiber consumption. I try to encourage my patients, you know, I'm, I'm recommending fiber to pretty much everyone. In their um, diet or as a supplement? Both. Both. To be honest with you, yes. Because I, I don't think there's any such thing as too much fiber. I do think there's too much too fast, meaning that you ramped it up too fast. Mm -hmm. You got to give your body a chance to adapt. Now there's a kind but, of fiber that starts with an A. Is it like acacia fiber or something like this? That is one type. That is one type of fiber. And there's, there's different types too. There's guar gum and, um, you know, there's specific, uh, specific strains of fiber. For example, inulin, is a type of soluble fiber uh -huh. that what's cool about inulin is it's this large complex molecule. And so because of its complexity, it basically gets all the way down to the distal colon, meaning the left side of the colon mm -hmm. before it gets fermented. Now inulin, like if, if people listening at home go out and start taking inulin, you know, tomorrow, you're going to find that it produces a lot of gas. And that's, again, where you, you need to start low and ease your body into it to give your microbiome a chance to adapt to this change in the way that you're eating. And is there uh, a healthy brand like that's organic? Because I always worry about if it's not organic, where it's coming from, if it's GMO or if it's pesticides in it. But do you, do you recommend a healthy brand of non-soluble or maybe inulin or a special kind of fiber to look for? Well, here's what I recommend, to be honest with you, is number one, you are absolutely correct. You want it to be non-GMO. You want it to be organic. And that's something that you have to look to the label to understand. Right. Um, but, but beyond that, let's go back to the science. What is the science telling us? At the end of the day, the science is telling us that the diversity of plants is what matters the most. Mm -hmm. And so... I don't believe in just taking one type of fiber and pounding it hard, hard, hard. I believe in getting a couple different types and mixing and matching a little bit and sort of, you know, a little bit here, a little bit there. That's what I believe in. I have five different types of fiber at home. And, you know, at the end of the day, you want to do the one that you're comfortable with right. because you want to make sure that you're getting it done. Yeah, and you want to feel like it's a clean source of it. But what you're saying is just make sure it's insoluble fiber, right? No, no sorry, soluble fiber, but many different kinds and and vary them like from week to week. You could do one one week, another one another week, and just keep alternating them, but just make sure that they're soluble. Exactly. And, you know, whatever works for you, whether it be week to week or 
you know, like for me, together. yeah, I wake up in the morning and, um, I have this morning routine that I really love. It's, it's something that I started doing a little over a year ago. I have this theory that basically we get dehydrated at night, you know, I mean, you're not having anything to eat or drink. You may get up and go to the restroom a couple of times and you wake up in the morning and most Americans go and start chugging coffee immediately. Yeah. And it dehydrates you even more. And so what I have started doing, and you know, to be honest with you, I feel so much better doing this. I wake up and I have a huge glass of water and I'll mix in one of my fiber supplements in there. And I do that every morning, first thing. I feed That's my cool. Gut. I'm going to do that because I do it with lemon, and I'll do my first glass with lemon and my second glass with fiber. Yeah, or mix them both together, yeah. honestly. I mean, if it's yeah. valuable fiber, then you can mix it up and you won't even know it's there. Yeah, that's great. So, but yeah, and, and basically, you know, this water and with, with the soluble fiber with the prebiotic in it, it turns on my brain, it turns on my kidneys, it turns on my gut, it feeds my microbiome. So I'm off to a good start. That's cool. I've got a couple in the house here. I want to check if they're soluble or insoluble. I assume it's soluble. I think one of them is the acacia one I asked you about, but I'm going to check it out and try that tomorrow. Okay, now... And there's nothing wrong with insoluble fiber either, to be honest with you. No, but but if you're using it as a prebiotic to kind of feed and vary your microbiome, then you're better off with the soluble, right? Yeah, and and let's just look at the facts here. The average woman in the United States gets 18 grams of fiber per day. I would argue that she should be getting at least twice, but honestly, more like three times that amount of fiber. Mm-hmm. And so well, that's we not are, surprising because so many people don't eat veggies. Oh, totally. And and, 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 and grains have gotten the same rap as soy. Beans are avoided by. All the paleo, all the grains are avoided by paleo. So, I mean, they're lacking so much fiber in that diet. It's scary. Absolutely. And, and, and honestly, all of these health issues that we see emerging that I was alluding to earlier in our conversation, you know, autism, Parkinson's, yeah. celiac disease, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, I mean, IBS, I, IBS, Crohn's disease, ulcerative colitis, these things don't exist in Africa. I know, I know, this is what I have said, they don't, you don't have these problems in Africa where people eat vegetables and not meat, it's crazy how much diet has an effect, and we just, we, I'm so, I'm so happy that there's medical doctors that know this stuff, it just makes me smile from ear to ear, because they're treating it with drugs when you just got to change your diet. It's such a huge impact to, to consume the right food for these kind of diseases. But I'm curious too, as a medical doctor who does colonoscopies, I, I want to know what the colon of, say, a healthy, I'm going to call it a healthy, even though I don't think it's a healthy diet, a healthy paleo person, meaning someone who's seriously doing it and not doing their sugar because they take out all the processed food and sugar and all dairy. So to me, like you said, there's a lot they're doing right, but they're consuming a lot of meat with no grains or or beans, which is dangerous, I think. So have you ever seen a person's colonoscopy that's a good paleo eater for a while, say, you know, four or five years? versus a plant-based person for four or five years? And is there a difference in looking at them? Well, what I'll, what I'll tell you is this. I mean, I do think that there can be some differences. They're not, to me, as overt as, like, for example, if someone is a smoker. I mean, I, I can tell 95% of the time whether or not someone's a smoker just by looking at them from across the room. Wow. When it comes to paleo versus you know, standard American diet versus vegan or vegetarian, plant-based, it can be hard to tell. And, you know, part of it is that our body is reflective when it comes to those types of things, like the general structure of the colon, it's reflective of the way that you've eaten over the years, not just how you're eating right now. And so, you know, for many people, they may change their diet, you know, they may have changed their diet 18 months ago. But prior to that, they ate the standard American yeah, diet. And, and so they have a long way to go, really. It's true. 
That's yeah. that's true. That's a good way to, to explain it because I imagine if someone's a lifelong healthy whole food vegan eater, you're going to notice that they have a healthy colon because it's just many, many years of doing the right thing. I think it would be so interesting to go to uh, to Loma Linda, California, and do some colonoscopies right. um, because... It, you know, what you come back to is I actually find the blue zones to be a fascinating concept. Yeah. Um, because the, you know, it wasn't, I don't think, intended from the beginning to necessarily be this answer to our scientific query of what is the right way to live and to eat. I, I guess maybe that is what they were trying to do, but, but, What's fascinating to me is that you have that come out, the blue zones. And for the people at home who ha- are not familiar with this book, basically uh, there is a, a gentleman named Dan Butner who identified five places throughout the world where people are living to be 100 years old routinely. And you know, even more importantly, they're not just living to be 100 but like they have, they're like in their seventies, eighties, nineties without medical issues, yep. getting around just fine, very happy, not taking medications, frankly, not having access to healthcare. But who cares when you're healthy? And so these five places are Loma Linda, California, which is where the Seventh Day Adventists live, and they, of course, are plant based. Um, that's the only place in the United States that qualifies for as a blue zone. Mm -hmm. And then the other four places are the Nicoya Peninsula in Costa Rica and um, Sardinia and uh, Greece. There's a particular island in Greece. And then finally... Wasn't it Okinawa? uh, And then finally Okinawa in Japan. Yeah. And so, so it's those five, these five places, you know, again, United States, Costa Rica, um, off the coast of Italy, Greece, and Japan. So we're talking about literally around the world. And what's fascinating is that there are certain themes that pulled them all together in terms of you know how they ate that like these trends that were there. And so you know they were all eating beans. They were all plant based. Ninety to I mean, the in these societies there was some consumption of meat in many of them. But it's totally different than the way that we do it in the United States. And the United it, States, I think the percentage was very low. Like, wasn't it less than 10% of their diet or something? Easily less than 10%. Yeah. I mean, basically what you're looking at is once or twice a week, they would have a two to four ounce. I mean, the concept of a two ounce steak, most Americans can't even imagine what that <laughs> would look like. A two to four ounce piece of meat that was more commonly um, chicken or goat, um, and not really beef, to be honest. And but what they did is they they made it as a garnish, mm-hmm. and they enjoyed the flavor of it. But they but the the backbone of their diet was the plants. Ninety to ninety five percent of their calories came from plants. And by the way, no access to processed foods. Right. And I would argue it's all those plants where the flavor really is because, I mean, you have so much variety in plant foods. It's so amazing when you look at all the thousands of veggies and fruits that we have and all the things you can make from it and the different flavors. It's really exciting once people learn just how to use them and cook with them. I know it's overwhelming in the beginning, but once you get there, it's so much more interesting and it's where all the good stuff is. There's there's at least five thousand phytochemicals. We're talking about you know stuff like beta carotene or quercetin or resveratrol. Those are just a couple examples. Frankly, most of them we know very little about at this point, but we know that they exist. And you know when we talk about things that protect you from cancer, things that strengthen your immune system, this is the kind of stuff that we're talking about, and it comes from the plants. And so you know. I'll just share anecdotally my own personal experience. In our first, in our in our first um, visit, I talked about how I used to have a bacon, egg, and cheese for breakfast mm-hmm. and an Italian sub for lunch. And so, on my personal quest, I started to change my diet, and it's not something that I did overnight. I made changes over time. I started to, 
you know, cut down on my red meat consumption. I started to increase my consumption of green smoothies. And basically this sort of happened to this process over the course of a year or two years. Well, science shows us that you can change your microbiome and your microbiome is number one, made up of the types of foods that you eat. Number two, it controls your taste buds. So the people who try to make a radical change to their diet, many times they will fail because basically they'll get an impulse where they just can't control themselves. They have to eat that sugar. They have to eat that meat. Mm. And that's actually because their microbiome is starving. And it was too much of a shock to the system to make a change like that. And so, but if you make that change slowly over time, you can allow your, your microbiome to adapt with you. And so for me, I made that sort of change slowly over time. And here's what's cool. So I went to a microbiome conference in Paris, Paris earlier this year. And by the way, if you ever get the chance to travel to Paris for a business meeting, it's a really great thing because you can write it off. Yeah. And so. How fun. So, uh, so I went to Paris and, you know, anytime you travel, you miss the food that you ate back home. French food's amazing, but I missed the food that yeah. I had back home. France, France and, is not that easy with, you know, I know I've been there and it was difficult to be 100% vegan sometimes. Yeah. But Sure, absolutely. And so I could not wait to get back and have a salad and a kombucha. Like I could <laughs> not wait. I know. And I go through the same thing every time I go on a trip. I'm like... Oh, I can't wait to get back to my healthy, good food. Even though what I ate was good, it's just like you love, you know, you miss it. There's a better. So it's just funny to me because years ago, here's this guy, you know, single, early 30s, rocking bacon, egg, and cheeses left and right. That's pretty funny. And now here I am, you know, like craving salads, craving kombucha. That's so cool. And it just feels so good because yeah. you're craving something that you know is good for your body. That's cool. Well, I'm happy to hear uh, that's one of my questions. Let's talk food now, and I want to talk about some some fermented foods. I want your opinion on fermented foods, and I know you have some easy, fast, favorite recipes, but from what you just said, kombucha is healthy and okay then, right? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Kombucha is okay. So let me say this. I think that fermented foods is one of the missing puzzle pieces, to be totally honest with you. So if you go back and look through evolutionary history, humans have consumed fermented foods in an organized way for at least 10,000 years. But even before that, you can imagine that over the entire course of human history, we were consuming fermented foods and we were, we were evolving with our diet and these bacteria that we were introducing into our body through the consumption of a fermented food. So for example, like prior to 10,000 years ago, what am I talking about? I'm talking about a piece of fruit that falls on the ground and the hunter gatherer picks it up off the ground after it's been there for a day and eats it and notices that actually they enjoy the flavor. Mm -hmm. And by the way, that's a partially fermented food. And so, so we evolved to eat fermented foods. This was a part of every single culture in human history. If you go back and you look across the world and then going back to our earlier discussion, Louis Pasteur, when we, when we discovered that bacteria were the problem, and around that time developed ways where we did not have to eat fermented foods from a preservation perspective, that's when we dropped them. And so basically we said, okay, we don't need this for preservation. Mm. Let's go and eat this food that's got a preservative. Let's go and eat this food that's canned. We got a refrigerator. We got a freezer. And so, so we gave up on eating these fermented foods. And now here we are. It is 2017. The gut is the root of all of these problems that we're seeing in the United States. Yeah. And, we're, and what is the tie that binds them all together? We are losing bacterial species. The number of species in an American on average is about 500 in the gut. Now that sounds like a lot, but if you go to Africa, 
that have 1,500 or 1,600 species. So we are operating with one third wow. the number of bacteria that we used to have. Wow. That's like animals going extinct on this planet. An animal goes extinct and there's going to be repercussions. They're there for a reason. Yeah. And, and so the same is true in our gut. Wow. And so these fermented foods, they, they help the variation of our species? So, so it's an opportunity for us to reintroduce healthy bacteria that, frankly, we may have lost because we've sterilized our world so much that if you lose those bacteria, if you lose those species, how are you going to get them back? And that's where, from my perspective, the fermented food comes into play. Let's use an example. I, I really love sauerkraut. I think sauerkraut is incredibly cool. So to make sauerkraut, you literally have two of the ingredients in your house right now. And the third one you can get for less than five bucks. And that is you need clean water. Um, it can't have the chlorine in it. So you either have to boil it or it needs to be filtered water. I recommend reverse osmosis. You need clean water. You need salt. Sea salt is ideal. It cannot be table salt because it has iodine. Iodine kills bacteria. Water, salt, and cabbage. That's all you need to make sauerkraut. And here's what's cool. Earlier I said 99% of the bacteria in our gut is anaerobic. These are the non-oxygen breathing bacteria. Well, when you make sauerkraut, the way that you do it, I'm going to tell you right now, if you're listening at home, how you do this. It's super easy. You grab yourself a mason jar. You take your cabbage. You wash it lightly, not with soap, just a little bit of water, nothing aggressive. And then you chop it up. You chop it up to whatever size you like for your, for your sauerkraut. And you pack it into that mason jar. And then what you do, I use something called a pickle pebble, but you can find these things on Amazon super easy. Basically, they're fermentation weights. Mm -hmm. They're designed to fit into the mason jar and you put it on top of your cabbage and you pour the sea salt solution, the brine over the top to cover the whole thing so that all of the cabbage is underwater, including the pickle pebble. So now everything is underwater in this mason jar and basically by putting it underwater, you have created an anaerobic environment. Mm. So you are selecting for these anaerobic bacteria to multiply. And that's what they do. Sometimes we call these bacteria lactic acid bacteria right, because what they do. I know. Exactly. They transform the cabbage from salty cabbage into sauerkraut. And if what you what you do is you if you check the jar every day, at about two days, you're gonna start to see bubbles forming. But by seven days, it's going to taste different. It's not going to taste like cabbage anymore. It's going to have that tartness, mm -hmm. that vibrance, um, the um, the sour flavor that you get when it's sauerkraut. And so, and that is basically these food, the, these bacteria that naturally exist on the cabbage. They're already there. You don't need to import them. These natural bacteria transform the food from cabbage into sauerkraut. And here's what's cool. Cabbage by itself, I would argue, is probably one of the 10 healthiest foods that exists. Yeah, very anti-cancerous. Absolutely. Numerous, numerous uh, anti-cancer compounds, isothiocyanates, glucosinolates, uh, polyphenols, a number of polyphenols. You take that and you ferment it and actually you made it tremendously more healthy and you've unlocked hidden nutrition that you wouldn't have access to except through the fermentation process. And by the way, sauerkraut, when they study it, has something on the order of, now this is not going to be every single jar, every jar will be different, but when they studied it, they found up to 680 different species of bacteria. Wow. So for that person who only has 500 species of bacteria, which is like an average person in the United States these days, at a minimum, you are introducing 180 new species, potentially a lot more than that, mm. into your gut. And how much should a person eat for it to benefit them? Well, you know, when we talk about maximum diversity of plants, mm -hmm. I apply that same rule to fermented foods. Yeah, I was just going to ask you that if we need to be fermenting a bunch of different foods or if we can get the bacteria from one. 
Yeah, sauerkraut may be the best. Sauerkraut may be like the fermentation equivalent of kale or, or broccoli sprouts. Mm-hmm. But again, I think that you, what I would really encourage people to do is to take up fermentation as a hobby, do it yourself. And I will tell you that for me, I got started on this path after reading one particular book called The Art of Fermentation by Sandor Katz. Mm -hmm. And this book is a James Beard award-winning book. James Beard, if you've ever been to a James Beard award-winning restaurant, James Beard has never let me down. He always gets it right. And so, and that's true with this book too. If you read this book, it teaches you not recipes. It teaches you the, the tools that you need to understand how to do this. And then you just experiment. And so let's go back to kombucha. Kombucha is fermented sweet tea. If you go to your supermarket, you're probably going to spend at least $3.50 for a bottle of kombucha, and that's fine. You can do that. I buy a kombucha at the store every once in a while as well. But to make kombucha at home, all you need is water, sugar, and tea. And then beyond that, you just need the proper starter culture. Right. So, Which you can buy. Make off of Amazon. Yeah. Or, or you have, if you have a friend who makes it, they'll share it with right. you. Right. And so, you know, when you have a, a plant like sauerkraut, we talk about wild fermentation, meaning that you're taking advantage of the bacteria that already exist on that plant to transform it into this amazing, powerful fermented food. When we talk about kombucha, well, sweet tea obviously doesn't have bacteria already on it. You're boiling water with tea and, and sugar. But once that water ter- returns to room temperature, you can introduce the healthy bacteria from a kombucha starter along with something called a SCOBY, which stands for Symbiotic Colony of Bacteria and Yeast. And this is the the thing that looks like a mushroom floating on the top yeah, of the kombucha. Yeah, it's weird. Yeah. I, I love scobies. I, I think know. they're so they're cool. They're so cool. They're I, like out of space stuff. Oh, it's like an alien. I actually like have respect for my scoby, to be honest with you. And so, you know, when you make kombucha, every time you have a new batch, like I love making kombucha because it's so fun to experiment with flavors. Like right now I have on my counter, I'm looking over at it right now. I have peach with cinnamon. I have peach with mint and I have lemon with mint. Wow. And so, and like I'll, I'll do raspberry and strawberry, blueberry. I mean, whatever you like, honestly. Okay, time to take a little break and have a sip of your fermented drink. Right now, I'm drinking a GT's kombucha. It's their summer flavor. It's watermelon, cherry, lime, and it has a big Liberty logo on the bottle. I absolutely love this. You know, I love kombucha, but I didn't used to drink it that much because I was pretty sensitive to caffeine. But a lot of kombuchas, I found out that when they ferment, they take the caffeine away. So I haven't had any issues with this one, and I've been drinking it all summer long. So if you get a chance, try to pick one up at your natural food store. It's a special summer flavor that may be ending now soon. Next, I just want to say thank you to all of you out there that have left a review or are using my Amazon banner. I so appreciate you guys. It means the world to me. I hope you guys have learned a lot from this show and that you can spread the word around and help your family and your friends and other people and pass the word of the podcast on to other people that you know need help because our goal is to reach as many people as possible and try to get this planet and people healthy again. So again, you guys, thanks so much from the bottom of my heart. Now let's go back and talk to Dr. B. Oh, I just, well, of course, it's bought. I haven't ventured into making my own kombucha. My sister's doing it, and I would love to do that. But, and I will, I will try it because it's really interesting, the art of fermentation. But there's this summer flavor that they did with this GT. It's called GT's, you know, that's the brand. Oh, yeah. And you know, oh, yeah. a He's famous the, the brand, GT's right? Kombucha. Yeah, his uh, mom cured herself of breast cancer, she thinks, with kombucha and fermentation. But anyway, their summer flavor is watermelon, cherry, lime. Oh, I'm like addicted to this stuff. It's so good. Yeah. Oh, that's amazing. And, you know, what's cool is you could, if you ever go for it, you can do that yourself. Right. And it's, it's so inexpensive. I mean, literally, I tea, gotta try sugar, it. water. 
and then a starter culture with the SCOBY. Now, when but, it ferments, know, is it eating the sugar so that in the end you're not getting all the sugar as something bad? Yeah, that's one of the things that's cool is if you let it, if you let it do its job, which to me, I mean, it's, it's going to depend on a couple of different factors like the temperature in your house. But if you let it do its job after about two weeks, there's going to be very little sugar left over. There will be a little bit of alcohol. But really what it's doing is it's transforming that sugar into a combination of polyphenols. Polyphenols are health-promoting compounds and have strong antioxidant and anti-inflammatory properties. But also there's data that shows that show that polyphenols by themselves directly have a good effect on the gut microbiome. Mm -hmm. So these are great, powerful things. And then the other thing is there's healthy acids. So, you know, we talk about wanting to have an alkalotic diet. Mm -hmm. You know, to have things that are not acidic. And that's, that's true in the sense that we want more plants. But healthy acids, such as what you get in kombucha or what you get from lemon water, that's a different story. That's actually really good for the body. Yeah, that's, that's great. And are there other veggies or fermented foods that you love a lot? Like I know my sister does fermented carrots that she loves and they really have had them. They're great. What other things do you ferment? Uh, I, you know what, basically if I see something in front of me, I start brainstorming how I'm going to do it. If it's a plant, like that's what I love about the plants is the bacteria are already there. So let me give you an example. I really dig doing watermelon rinds. Really? incredibly easy to do all you got to do it, yeah it ends up coming out like a pickle but better because it's crunchier oh my gosh i would have never thought about that oh yeah you, you just literally you just peel the green skin off the watermelon and you cut off the red part like the meat mm -hmm. and you just keep the the white rind and same concept of what i said with the sauerkraut you submerge it in a sea salt solution and you put in whatever flavors you like. So like I'll put in garlic and dill and black peppercorns and it ends up tasting like a pickle. Mm. Um, with sauerkraut, I will give it like I'll start tasting my sauerkraut after a couple of days. But to me, it just keeps getting better and better and better like wine. Mm -hmm. with, with other stuff, like for example, if I ferment watermelon rinds, I'll start tasting it, and if it ever starts to feel like it's losing its crunch, that's where I say, okay, once it starts losing its crunch, I want to lock it in. I don't want to lose any more crunch because I like the crunchiness. And is there a point where, let's say you've done it, it's in your jar, it's in your fridge now, it's finished, and maybe you didn't eat it all. Is there a point where it's not good anymore? That's really hard to answer because it, that could literally be more than six months. Wow, <laughs> so, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. If you put it in your fridge, I mean, basically, once you put it in your fridge, it's like locking in the fermentation right where it is because you slow it down so much that basically it just kind of stays where it is. Mm, cool. So, and is yeah. there anyone who, who gastrically can't handle fermented food? Well, you know, fermentation is interesting because it's almost like pre digestion. Mm -hmm. You know, if you look at it, it's almost this is one of the things that's so beautiful about nature is it's like a microcosm of what's going to happen inside of our own bodies mm -hmm. so it's just making it easier so most people find like fermented foods produce less gas and bloat than non-fermented foods Interesting. now are there certain populations that should be careful with this stuff absolutely and so just to name a few if if you have a history of alcohol abuse I don't recommend that you drink kombucha because it does it, it doesn't have a lot of alcohol. I mean, literally, you'd have to have like eight glasses of kombucha to equal one beer. But it could have more than you know because sometimes, especially if you're making at home, I know like at higher. our market, they now have a kombucha bar because they had some problems with a company where it was fermenting so much it was actually above the alcohol limit. And so the ones that they bottle and you buy – you don't even notice any alcohol because it's so low, but they can. Yeah, it's less than 0.5% if you buy it at the store. Right. But if you make it at home, you're absolutely right. It could be up to 3%. So then you, that's a good point. People who have a history of alcohol abuse or alcoholism, they should be careful and not consume kombucha. What else? Who else? Well, people who, um, there are a lot of fermented foods mm -hmm. and 
and to be honest with you, if you just kind of use your head to make fermented foods, is very safe. If you see something that looks like it doesn't fit, or if it smells like it doesn't fit, then you just got to move on from that batch and not use it. Right. Um, now, in pregnancy, fermented foods can actually be incredibly healthy and good for mom and good for baby. But of course, I would encourage people in that sort of setting to make sure that they're doing it in a way that's safe. I would probably review it with your OBGYN. And there's certain foods that are unpasteurized that may be fermented, like some cheeses that you just want to avoid altogether because they could carry a bacteria such as listeria. Mm -hmm. But, you know, for example, consumption of kombucha during pregnancy, from my perspective, is very safe. Yeah. Well, and some of these amazing vegan cheeses out now, they're so delicious. It's like, and I know oh my gosh, that's just part of the process, cheese. you know, like Miyoko Shinner's her vegan, you could call it vegan butter, but it's, she uses fermented cashews in there. And it's just that little hint of that sour fermented taste that makes it so delicious. And it won the, I think it won the number one award for the fast new vegan product when it came out. And that was amongst all kinds of, it wasn't just vegan stuff. I think it was at the health show. So it was vegan, non-vegan, everything, but it is, it's so delicious. Not that you want to eat a lot of it, but if you need a little vegan butter, oh my gosh, her fermented butter is incredible. So yeah, it gives that that little sour taste. There's all these vegan fermented yogurts now, coconut yogurts and almond yogurts and oh, cashew yogurt now. There's a company that makes it out. I make my own yogurt and I ferment it with a, a probiotic. I just put a probiotic can capsule in there. I love making my own. It's so much easier, cheaper, and healthier because you can put more probiotics in it. Yeah, there's a, there's a there's a dairy free. Uh, a cashew based kefir mm -hmm. that, I, that I've had recently that's very good and then we have this vegan cheese that our daughter is obsessed with and it's from Field Roast I think the right way to say it is Chao C-H-A-O right. yeah that's and, that was Victoria Moran's favorite I had to go check it out after she told me that which one does your daughter like which flavor oh gosh I forget what it's called I could go grab is it out it of the fridge is it yellow or right white now, it's white. Yeah, it's. Uh, I know which one. Then I know which one. That's the one she loved too. It's the creamy one. Yeah. Oh, it's so good. And actually, what's amazing about it, so first two things. Like first of all, it's actually made from fermented tofu, which I find to be really cool because it's incredibly healthy. Yeah. And the uh, and the second thing is when we make grilled cheese for our daughter using using that cheese, it it melts in a way that I mean it's really amazing I like know, it's impossible that's so to great. it's really there's no excuse not to be plant-based anymore because cheese was the big thing that held people up but not anymore i just interviewed dr neil barnard about his cheese book and you know we were talking about all the wonderful cheeses out there so now it's actually pretty easy yeah no, that's really cool actually today we um we did some cooking on our grill outside and we had uh, vegan plant-based burgers and they were delicious and I mean just amazing yeah it's so amazing you can have any substitute you want and the flavors can be incredible people just need to as you said for most people they got to step into it slowly but however you get there whatever amount you can do the more you can do the more you can slide the slider to 100% plant-based the more it will help you the better you'll feel I agree 100%. So all health starts in the gut. So Dr. B, I know you recommend so much about these fermented foods that we've been talking about a lot today, but what about taking probiotics? Do you recommend them? And is that for everyone? If so, how often and which brand do you love? That's a great question. And I, and I love this topic because, you know, at face value, both of these methods, fermented foods and probiotics, are a way to introduce healthy bacteria back into the gut. And, you know, as we've been discussing, one of my real concerns is that we've hyper sterilized our world. We've removed all the bacteria from our food. We've put chlorine into our water. 
uh, chemicals and preservatives in our foods that we don't even know what they do. We have these chemicals that we clean in the shower and, and, you know, they may be excessively strong. And so we need ways to reintroduce healthy bacteria. And so I'm a strong believer in fermented foods. This is the way that we ate for literally millions of years. I mean, from an organized perspective where we were intentionally creating fermented foods, it's been about 10,000 years, but but clearly the consumption of fermented foods, you know, when we were hunters and gatherers, that's been going on for millions of years. And we developed mm-hmm. a relationship with these bacteria. And I'm a real believer that everyone should be consuming fermented foods. This is the way that we ate. This is the way that we evolved to eat over those millions of years. And then all of a sudden we decided in the 19th century, because we could can our food or we could preserve our food with chemicals or because we developed the refrigerator that, hey, we don't need to, to eat these, these fermented foods anymore. And I think that was a mistake. So with that being said, probiotics are definitely different than consuming fermented foods. For example, when I make my own sauerkraut at home, there have been studies that have shown that that sauerkraut may contain something on the order of 680 different species of bacteria, which I love because I want to invite as many different species into my gut and allow them to bring all their skills with them to help to help me thrive and and be as healthy as possible. When I when I recommend probiotics to my patient to my patients, they may have eight different species of bacteria. So clearly you're not getting the diversity that you get in a probiotic that you would find in fermented foods. Mm. But that being said, the advantage of the probiotic is that you are selecting out specific bacteria that we believe to have a health promoting effect and you're taking them in high concentrations. And our studies demonstrate to us consistently that the dose of the probiotic is very important. For example, you may think that 10 billion bacteria is a lot, but 10 billion bacteria, when you compare it to 50 trillion, is nothing. That's kind of like, so to take a probiotic with 10 billion bacteria, that would be like me going to my pool in my backyard and pouring a a can of beer into my pool and thinking that the whole pool is going to turn into beer now, like, It doesn't work that way. But what you can do with probiotics is you can take them in a high concentration. And I'm talking about more than 100 billion bacteria at once. And by doing that, it may only be eight species, but it's eight beneficial species. And they can tip the balance. And so basically what you're trying to do with the probiotic is you're trying to introduce a high dose of healthy bacteria. Those healthy bacteria will basically help strengthen, fortify the good side, the good bacteria. And in the process, you're weakening the, the, the bad bacteria and, you know, basically, um, subduing them. And Mm -hmm. so, so, so there is an advantage to probiotics. The question is, should everyone be taking a probiotic? And, you know, the way that I feel about that question is there, there are no studies to show me yet that everyone should be taking a probiotic. But when I look around and I see, you know, the types of diseases that are emerging in our society, I say we need to put our guard up from a gut health perspective. This is the reason why I consume fermented food every day. This is the reason why I take prebiotic fiber supplements every day is I want to keep myself healthy. I don't ever want to develop one of those diseases. And so a probiotic can be a part of a strategy to maintain health. There's not much of a downside except the cost. Mm -hmm. And the one thing that I will say is I would really encourage all of your listeners to think about probiotics in this regard. Many doctors will treat all probiotics as if they're the same. They'll say to their patient, hey, go take a probiotic. But they won't tell you which one. And I actually have a problem with that because if we're talking about a very complicated environment in our gut, hundreds of different species, trillions of bacteria. How do you know that this tablet that you're taking that has these beneficial bacteria, how do you know it's even going to deliver those bacteria or that it's going to actually have an effect that leads to better health outcomes in the end? How do you know that? And so 
what I say is this, I would really encourage people to use probiotics that have the backing of studies. And so Mm -hmm. the probiotic that I use, one of the questions that you asked is, which one do you use? So the one that I recommend to my patients is something called a VSL number three. And it's been around for more than 15 years. And the advantage of this back of this probiotic VSL number three is that it's at a very high dose. It's eight strains of bacteria and it has the backing of good randomized controlled studies. So, you know, when they take studies, when they study patients that have irritable bowel syndrome and they basically split them up and they give them either a sugar pill or this probiotic VSL number three, and the patient doesn't know which one they're taking and the investigator, the researcher doesn't know which one they're taking until the very end. And they get to the end and they measure how the patient feels relative to the beginning and the ones taking the probiotic feel better compared to the ones taking the sugar pill. Uh That to me is powerful. Yeah. And that shows me that it works. Can we buy that or is that only from doctors? VSL number three, there's three doses of VSL and the numbers when you look at them (laughs) sound ridiculous. Um, Like a low dose of VSL number three comes in a capsule And it's 112 billion bacteria. Uh And the medium dose is a packet of 450 billion bacteria. And then the the high dose is 900 billion bacteria. And it's almost a trillion, which is amazing. So, So the answer to that question is this. If you are a healthy person sitting at home listening to this podcast right now and you want to take a good probiotic, I would encourage you to pick up the capsules of VSL3, which you can order from their website. Um, You may even be able to find it at your drugstore, but you'll have to ask at the pharmacy because they'll keep it in a refrigerator. And um, it's a capsule. And if you're healthy, I think it's reasonable to take one capsule per day. If If you're suffering with GI issues, that's a different story. And so for my patients, I'm generally recommending that they take either two capsules which would be the equivalent of 225 billion, or I'll prescribe the packet to them. And the packet, if they take a full packet every day, the packet is 450 billion. So that's what I'm using for many of my patients who are suffering with GI disease. And that one's by prescription only? You can actually get it without a prescription. Um, But you don't recommend it because you kind of have to know what you're doing when you're I think so. Yeah. I think when you're getting up to that dose and you're going to be investing also that kind of money, you should be doing it under the guidance of your physician. Right. Sadly, there's not a lot of physicians like you, though, that would go, oh, I'll support you on that. And I know what you're talking about, but we're getting more and more of them. So that's good. It'll happen. I think, you know, it may take five or 10 years, but I think it's happening, actually. Yeah. Yeah, it's yeah. happening a lot more by you in California than it is down here in South Carolina. But you know, we're I'm working on it. I'm doing everything I can yeah, to get everyone on board. That's good. So. You're our you're the guy there to push it, get it going. So that's cool. Got it. Yeah. It's got to take someone to be you know step up the front of the line and be the leader. So it's great you're doing all you're doing and you're doing these talks to just get the word out, get the message out because that's why we're doing what we're doing, right? Absolutely. Yep. So now I've got a really complicated question, and I know we probably could do a whole episode on this, but I'm so interested in it, and I want to hear your take on it. I want to know about the connection to, because you talked earlier about the brain and the gut, and a lot of people say that our gut is called our second brain now. So can you explain the connection of this gut-brain barrier? Sure. This is it, it, This could be an entire... Uh, podcast. It's a fascinating topic. And so let's just do a quick sort of overview of this, of this topic. Um, so the gut is now referred to as the enteric nervous system. And so, you know, that's where the nickname, the second brain comes from, because basically the gut is capable of operating completely independently. It does not re- it does not require any signal from your actual brain in order to do its job. So all of the motility, the constant movement of all 20 to 25 feet of intestine, um, the secretion of enzymes and, um, and digestive juices, all of those things are done by the gut without any requirement from the brain to tell it to do so. It can do it by itself. That being said, the gut does have a connection to the brain and 
there's one particular nerve called the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is, I think about it like a, um, a direct phone line between the brain and the gut. Because it's a, it's a two-way messaging system. The brain, in moments of stress, can send a signal to the gut through the vagus nerve to basically say, uh, there's something going on and I need you to basically just take a break for a minute. And the way that I think about that, like how, why did we develop that sort of connection or that, that stress response? Well, if you go back to sort of like cavemen times, if you get attacked by a saber-toothed tiger, you have an advantage in that moment if you actually divert blood away from your gut into your legs so that you can run and climb a tree. And so, so we needed a way, we evolved to have a way where in times of stress, we could basically kind of shut down the gut and use that blood for other necessary things to promote survival. Well, here we are, it's the 21st century and, you know, our stress these days is more like someone cuts you off on the highway or you have a bad day at work or, you know, whatever it may be. And so it's no longer needed for survival to be able to shut down the gut, but there are consequences to this connection that we developed where, you know, very, very clearly during times of stress, many people manifest that stress in their gut. And this is the reason why that happens is through this vagus nerve where, you know, basically it'll send a signal and say, hey, I need you to take a break and just shut it down. But if you shut it down, I mean, if you're in the middle of trying to digest and process your food and you just shut down digestion, I don't think you're going to feel very well. And that's that's essentially what happens. Mm. So the um, there is there is even more to this story that's very interesting. The gut is the second largest collection of of nerves in the entire body. Believe it or not, you have five times more nerves in your gut than you do in your spinal cord. Wow. Um, it is the uh, it is the origin of ninety percent of the of the neurotransmitter serotonin, which I describe as the happy hormone. Uh-huh. Because serotonin affects mood very clearly. And so when I, if I were to treat someone for depression, I could prescribe them a serotonin reuptake inhibitor. And that's a way to basically boost their serotonin levels to improve their mood. Well, 90% of serotonin is produced in the gut. And, you know, what I find to be very interesting is that patients who had irritable bowel syndrome GI doctors noticed, I mean, we've noticed for a long time now that IBS is very uh, strongly associated with with anxiety. Hmm. And so many GI doctors felt, I mean, basically the prevailing theory was that, well, that is an anxious patient and because they're anxious, they manifest their GI disease in their gut. And this this breakthrough uh, in terms of the gut and our understanding of this serotonin connection is changing how we look at that because uh, basically if you if you alter the bacteria in the gut you will affect the serotonin and the serotonin will affect your mood and it will also affect motility in the gut the reason why the serotonin is in your gut in the first place is because basically it sets the it sets the beat for the drum. Mm. And so if you alter that serotonin, like let's say that all of a sudden you're producing more serotonin than you need in that particular moment, you're going to get diarrhea. And if you produce too little serotonin, then you're going to get constipation. Wow, that's so interesting. Is, <laughs> it is. And so the bottom line is that is that the gut is uh has this other way of communicating with the brain through these neurotransmitters like serotonin that can affect your mood. And, you know, this is part of the reason why there's a a number of neurological diseases that we have now connected to changes in the gut. For example, Parkinson's disease or autism. And, you know, take autism, for example, there's very clear studies now that show that use of a probiotic during um, pregnancy and also use of a probiotic by the infant child shortly after birth are are both associated with decreased risk of developing autism later on. 
Well, and another way to say it too is that any practitioner or doctor who deals on a natural level with autistic patients, you see a strong connection between autism and gut problems. There's a huge connection, actually. At least 70% of autistic patients suffer with chronic GI illness. Right. So I've, I've had them in my practice, and they've all had gut issues and food allergies and all kinds of stomach problems. So that's so interesting. And also the other neurotransmitters that are made by the brain, like epinephrine and GABA and those, and you can see if serotonin is made in the stomach and that's a neurotransmitter, I'm just... I'm just thinking right now because the other neurotransmitters, I think, are made in the brain, right? And so they're predominantly connection. Yeah. Predominantly, but, but all of them can be produced in the gut to some degree. You wow. Know, and the, um, for example, the, the neurotransmitter dopamine, dopamine is 50% produced in the gut. So 50% brain, 50% gut. Wow, and that's so, that's really important to understand that when we learn how important neurotransmitters are. Yeah, no, it's I think it's fascinating, and you know, these the it's allowing us to create these connections between the gut and these other parts of the body that we never would have expected. But you know, it's like why are we having such an outbreak of autism? Why are we having such an outbreak of Parkinson's disease? Why is there such anxiety and depression in our society? And, you know, this is where I go back to my, one of my catchphrases, which is the gut is the root of all health. And For sure. I really believe that. And, you know, this is the reason we're now learning that it's really true. The gut is where these problems are starting. Well, and if you add in addition to all the toxins and chemicals that we're ingesting that are getting into our gut, including the mercury that's spewing out from all the coal industry, gets in our gut, and then that's like an antibiotic, so then it's killing all our bacteria. In addition to the pesticides and the chemicals that get in there that have an effect like GMO foods, so if we add all that together, sometimes it's more of a miracle how things can even work under the circumstances that we're putting it in. Don't you agree? It truly goes to show you how resilient we actually are. I mean, honestly, it's, yeah. it's amazing how resilient we are that, that we can live on average in the United States to be 78 years old these days. Um, despite what we're doing to our bodies. I know. I say that every day, Dr. B. It's crazy. The number of the number of chemicals and additives and preservatives that are in our food is alarming. And yeah. most people don't realize there there are five to six thousand chemicals and preservatives that are in our food that and they've almost all been developed in the last one hundred years. And so you know, if you kind of look at things from an evolutionary perspective, we are the first people in human history to be exposed to these five to six thousand chemicals, and we're and we're we're swallowing them down and allowing them to go to our most vulnerable place, which is our gut, and we have no clue what they do. A very very small percentage of them have had any human study. I mean, literally less than twenty percent have had any human study, and when we say human study. We're talking about like, hey, let's let's see how they do for a week and make sure they're still alive. Okay, they're alive. Okay, great. Let's now we can bring it into the market. Um, but eighty more than eighty percent have had literally zero human study to demonstrate safety. And it's so it's so it's scary. Just, but now we can understand why our life expectancy went down this year for the first time in a long time. And I also walk around in the food. All those those of us that eat whole foods and plant based. I walk around in the grocery store and I say, man, this is what people think is food. It's so scary. Look at the colors of this stuff. Look at the packaging. Look at how is this food? How can what's in this box or package feed any cell in our body? It has to just kill it instead of feed it. So it is, it is amazing how resilient we are that we can live the years that we do eating that kind of junk. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. I, I just have two two more questions. They're easy, not like the last ones, but I'm going to hold you to that. Maybe we should do a whole show on the gut brain barrier um, because that could be very interesting if you think there's enough information there. But let me ask you two simple questions. Okay. 
Um, one of the things I'm curious about in my experience, just people around me and in my practice, it seemed like sometimes people were really healthy eaters, vegan, plant-based, did a lot of right lifestyle stuff. And yet, as they got older, they seemed to deal with a lot of bloating issues after they eat. I'm wondering if you see this, not just in bad, you know, eating the SAD, sad American diet, but in healthy people, what, why would there be an issue with bloating? Well, bloating can come from uh, the way that I approach bloating as a gastroenterologist. And first, let me say that from a GI perspective, it's that is one of the most challenging symptoms for us because we don't have great tests uh, to really, you know, tell us what the cause of bloating is. So, but what I will say is this, is that there's only a few things that can, that can cause bloating. So first of all, it can be air that is swallowed. If you swallow air, it has to come out one end or the other. And so you either have to belch it up or pass it from below. And so any air that you swallow during a meal, or if you sip through a straw or you chew on gum, or you drink a carbonated drink, well, all of those things are basically bringing air into the body and it needs to be you know, eliminated one way or the other. So that's one thing to make sure to pay attention to is you know, during meals that you're not eating too fast, too aggressively, that, it, that it's good controlled swallows, not gulping your drink or things like that. So the second thing that can cause bloating is a change in the gut bacteria. And so if you, if you struggle to process your food because the bacteria are not there, then you're going to start to develop bloating as a result. And this is one of the reasons why a probiotic can protect against bloating. And this is also why uh, fermentation is actually advantageous in terms of reducing any sort of bloating that occurs. And so what I would say is even in the person who eats very healthy, very clean, we've still created a situation where we're not necessarily reintroducing those healthy bacteria. I mean, you can eat a, a plant-based diet, um, but if you have, you know, a clean home and you use the routine stuff that everyone uses in, in your shower and you have chlorine in your water without taking it out, all of these things have created a situation where, you know, you, there are ways where you can lose species of bacteria over time, even though you're eating healthy, even though you're eating a plant-based diet, you can still lose species of bacteria, but you don't have a way to replace those species. How are you going to get them back? And this is where I come back to, you know, our prior discussion about fermented foods and probiotics is we need a way to reintroduce healthy bacteria into our gut to make sure that we're always maintaining that balance as opposed to a, you know, what I would describe in the United States today as a, a, a one-way street that goes a direction that we don't want to go. Yeah. And so, so that's, that's one of the other issues. And then, and then the third thing can be motility. And so, um, constipation is probably the top cause of bloating that I see in my clinic. And so, it, and it's a motility issue. It's whether or not you're moving your bowels the way that you should. So, you know, the average person in the United States has about one bowel movement per day. And I would argue that even though we all consider that to be normal, that's pretty much universally abnormal from my perspective. We should be having two or three bowel movements per day because of the amount of fiber that we're consuming. And mm -hmm. so if, if you're not adequately moving your bowels, then basically what you're doing is whatever food you do eat, you're given more time for the bad bacteria in the gut, which we all have. There's Every single one of us has a couple of bad guys in there. If, you, if you're not moving your bowels, then you're giving those bacteria more time to chomp on the food and basically try to produce as much gas as possible. Mm -hmm. Wow, that's so. a lot of what you said makes sense because a lot of people eat. I know that's been one of my things. I'm, you know, eat fast and I don't chew my food. And I know through macrobiotics, they really work on chewing your food so much and eating slow. And that's, that's hard in today's society. So many people eat on the run. So you really have to work at that. And then if you look at the other two reasons why you said there's so many people constipated in general. So yep. it makes a lot of sense why this, why this happens. And my last question is, do you believe in digestive enzymes? 
I definitely, I, I can tell you firsthand in my practice that I've had some great success with digestive enzymes. And so um, at this point, the question is, which ones are effective and who are the right patients for us to be using them in? Mm -hmm. And so if you're using a plant-based digestive enzyme, if you feel better when you're taking it, I don't really see much of a downs downside, so I support that. When it comes to digestive enzymes that are prescription-based, they actually come from, they're actually derived from pigs. Mm -hmm. And those, those prescription-based digestive enzymes, they're very expensive. And so to me, they are, they are worthwhile for the people who really need them, who have an insufficient pancreas to produce those enzymes. Mm -hmm. But for the routine person, um, I don't think that you know, those prescription-based digestive enzymes would be a necessary thing. But again, if you try the plant-based digestive enzymes and you feel better while you're taking them, I support that. I don't really see tremendous downside to that. So everything you've said is really helpful advice, and I love that it's coming from a medical doctor because I always like to find those gems out in the world that are MDs but helping people with nutrition and food because, hey, look at, as Hippocrates said, let food be thy medicine and medicine be thy food. And our modern-day medicine has come a long way away from that. And so doctors like you are bringing us back to those times. So I appreciate you so much for doing the work that you're doing. And I'm so happy to have had you on this show. And I'm not going to let you go until you tell people how they can follow your work or become your patient or your social media handles or whatever that is. Well, uh, first of all, let me just say it's been such a privilege to chat with you and I've really enjoyed it. And I love the things that you're doing with this podcast because you're getting the message out for people and, you know, knowledge is power. And this is a way that, that you can really help people make a difference in their lives. That's meaningful. And so I, I really love that. I think Aww, it's great. Thanks, Dr. B. So I, I'm in Charleston, South Carolina. I'm in a gastroenterology practice called Low Country Gastroenterology and we're, we're located in Mount Pleasant. And so right now what I'm doing is I have an Instagram account and it's called Happy Gut MD. And so if you go to Happy Gut MD on Instagram, you're going to see the things that I'm putting out there. And you know, this has been such an exciting time for me because basically a year ago I started this account for the purpose of just, I, I felt like I had so much more to say than I could possibly say in 15 or 30 minutes during an office visit. Right. And so I kind of like to lay the groundwork at the office. And then I tell my patients, go online, read my stuff. And if you have questions, shoot me a text message and let's talk about it. Mm -hmm. And so, so it sort of started, you know, in that place of just like a way for me to have a voice in the same way that you have with your Vidal Speaks uh, podcast series. It's a, it's your voice to get the message out. Yeah. And so it started there and it's just, it's just been so fun and it's growing and people are feeling really connected to it. I, all of my, every single talk that I've given in Charleston has been sold out. I've had so many people there, you would not yeah. believe how many people here are I, fermenting food now. Oh, <laughs> it's like I hilarious. just, I can believe it because people really do want to feel better and they are really, really sick right now and they really do want to feel better and they want to do it without medicines more than ever. And they're ready and they just need coaches and guidance and support and your your Instagram or my podcast or I, I try to post photos too and it's just all that we can do to just keep encouraging people and is and from the deepest part of my heart part of for me eating plants is to to also save our planet because it's such in dire straits just as our own health is and so you're you're able to do two wonderful things, improve your health and improve the health of our planet. So it's it's a win-win for everyone. So I just encourage people to do that. And I'm gonna follow you on Instagram now that I know your your name there. So cool. So I guess I just want to end by you saying maybe you've told us so many wonderful things, but if you could just tell us three tips just to kind of immediately begin to change our diet or implement into our life. And it could be three of the things that you told us today. What three things would you leave the listeners with? All right. 
it, I think if you do these three things, then you're going to see improvements in your health. And so number one, maximum fresh fruits and vegetables. Plant-based diet is clearly the way to go. And so what that means is if you're moving towards a plant-based diet, avoiding processed foods and avoiding animal products. Number two, there is no such thing as too much fiber. There is only too fast. And so I really encourage everyone to look for opportunities to bring more fiber into their life, whether that be through natural approaches, the way that you eat, adding an extra smoothie, or taking a fiber supplement. I'm, I'm vegetarian. I'm plant-based. I take a fiber supplement every day, and many days I take it two or three times. I'm going to do that one. And number three, yeah, my my water with the with the fiber supplement first thing in the morning right. has worked really well for me. I'm gonna do that. And number three, I would encourage everyone to give fermented foods a try. And so that may mean in the very beginning that you just go to the store and you try this stuff out. If you look for things that are unpasteurized, that are you know that basically will say live active cultures. You can find this. Many stores now are carrying the sauerkraut or they're carrying the pickles. And you can find the kombucha or the water kefir. All of these things are are vegan and they're healthy. And I want everyone to give it a shot. And then I would encourage everyone to consider picking up fermentation as a hobby. It's fun. It's good for you. And it'll add a new taste to your palate that you are going to get addicted to really fast. I love that. And can you put some of that fermented coconut water in smoothies and once it's blended up, will it still stay stay okay? And will the bacteria stay okay by blending it that fast? I, you know, that's a great question. And I'm not 100% sure of the answer to that. So so what I tend to do, like many times we will add probiotics to our smoothies mm-hmm. as a family. Right. And so I, I will add them after the smoothie is already made. I'll mix them in. That's, with a that's a good point because it is just water. So just put it in at the end. Easy answer. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. B, thanks. It was really great talking to you and chatting with you about all this health stuff. It's my hobby, just, you know, learning to ask a lot of questions so we can all get smarter about what we can do to put our health into our own hands because that is where it has to go. We can't just put the blame out there on doctors or medications. We have to just step up to the plate and learn what to do ourselves. And the first thing we do is how we spend our dollar and what we spend it on to eat and what we put in our mouth. So you gave us a lot of great ideas today. So thank you from the bottom of my heart. I appreciate so much all this time you spent. So with gratitude, thank you. Thank you. It was such a pleasure. Wow, I really loved this interview today. And I do really want to know more about this gut-brain connection I think what we touched on was only the tip of the iceberg and so much of the brain is not really understood. So I can imagine that this is a very deep and intense subject, but I love how Dr. B explained the basic connection today. And wow, when you learn about this gut brain connection, you can see just how in trouble so many people are because digestive issues are huge and they have to be at an all time high. How many people do you know that have acid reflux or GERDs or who say they can't eat gluten because it hurts their belly? Or maybe they tell you they have IBS or some other stomach issues. It really is like an epidemic. And speaking of an epidemic, what Dr. B said today about the lack of fiber in our diet being the real problem to the point that it is like an epidemic. Wow, that was awesome. I've heard so many plant-based doctors talk about this. And how many times are vegans asked, where do you get your protein from? Well, we should begin to ask others, where do you get your fiber from? Even as a healthy whole food plant-based eater, it seems maybe that you can't get enough fiber even, or rather that you do get enough. But in this case, more is better. 
It's been known for a long time in the health industry that fiber has millions of health benefits. So why did Atkins, Weston Price, Paleo, and GAPS diets get so popular? What happened? And if we knew how important fiber was, then how did those diets get so popular to begin with? It's not about the protein, guys. It's about the fiber. So if you learn one thing today, guys, you need to remember that you need to eat as much fiber as possible and you even should take a supplement of soluble fiber like Dr. B said because that feeds the gut bacteria that are starving from the little fiber diets that most people have. I also loved hearing Dr. B's recipes for fermented cabbage and kombucha. Yum! And I already ordered that book, The Art of Fermentation, and I ordered another one on how to make my own kombucha. I can't wait. Oh, there's so much I want to do, and so little time, as they say. But this is one I definitely will try. And don't forget that sourdough is fermented, so try to learn to cook with more of that, too. That's something I really want to do more recipes with. Well, you guys, I think this is a great place to end. I hope you enjoyed the show today, my podcast family. You know what time it is, right? Yep, it's time to say goodbye. Till next week, take your fiber supplements and eat plants and fermented foods. Ta-ta for now, my friends. Vidal has spoken. Remember you heal with a plant-powered diet, homeopathy, and detoxing. Of course. Peace. Be healthy. Be free. Live life. <laughs>